Hey, great to see you this evening. You know, there's a reality in all of this that actually no matter what we do in our lives, no matter where we go, no matter what has happened and taken place in our lives, we are children of the living God. Nothing changes because of what we do. We still continue to be His children. Fantastic. We're great to see you this evening. Thank you so much for, for being here. We're going to continue our series on, on uh, what is in your hand. And the reality is that all of us are challenged with what God has placed in our hand. What are we going to do with it? We started this morning just to try and unpack what stewardship or, or making the decisions that align with what is planned for what is in our hand it should be. And so if, like Kat said, if you didn't get that, I would love you to just get a hold of that, uh, uh, what's it called, video cast, take a watch of that on the app, and let that be the foundation stone of what we're going to do. So Elizabeth and I thought it would be great for, just a second, Elizabeth and I thought it would be great, uh, yeah, Elizabeth and I thought it would be great this evening. Actually, not in a way of, of telling detail for detail's sake, and not in a way to, to say this is where you need to be and this is how you need to live, but actually just sharing a little bit of our story the good and the bad and the challenges. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do. And so I'm going to invite Elizabeth to come, uh, wife of my life. And yeah, great. Fantastic. Superb. So wh here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk together and just share a little bit about our why. And, and, and but before we do our why, we're going to try and just describe a little bit of our what. What is it that we do with our finances in relation to God? We're not going to tell you all the stuff that we do with our money, but just really what, about this whole business of what's in your hand. What has God done? What has God asked us and invited us to do with the resources that are in our hand? And how do have we responded to that through our lives? We're going to describe the what and try to communicate to you behind that the why. There are six whys that will bounce back and forth towards uh, with each other, and hopefully it'll be some help at the end of the night. You know, our story is unique, but our story is not special. It's just a unique story. It's full of mistakes and financial failures, but God has been faithful in all of our 37 years of a married life. And the detail, as I say, is really just to encourage you, uh, not to guilt trip you, not to manipulate you or cajole you. It's actually just to encourage you and perhaps even inspire you in what God is saying to you as you are writing your unique story of what is in your hand and how you want to release it. What we're going to do is I'm going to describe what the, the growing up was in my home. Liz is going to describe the growing up in her home. And then I'm going to tell you about the growing up and the, the living out in our home. And then we'll go back and forth about the whys. Is that okay? Yes. Fantastic. Well, in my home as I grew up, uh, everything was about offerings. I grew up in a, a Christian home. My mom and dad were lovely Christians. <clears throat> but the tithing was not part of our experience. Giving away a tenth of my mom and dad's income was not part of our story. It was all about offerings. And all over our home, we had little missionary boxes. There were tins and there were, there were boxes and there were things all over our home that you put pennies into all over the place. Missionaries that were in Zaire, missionaries that were in India, missionaries that were in, in different parts of Africa, South America, wherever they were and whatever they did, there was places all over our house that from time to time money would go in. I became aware of the fact that there was this financial transaction that took place every week. I was given an offering to put in. How, how many know it's wonderful to give away somebody else's money? Easy to give away somebody else's money. That was my reality. From Sunday school all the way up, I was given something that went into the offering. And so it was fantastic. When Even when I was a, a young, a, an older young man, still I was given, this is what you take to church because this is what you do. You give your money away. So I became aware and realized that actually there's a transaction that takes place here that some of the finance of my mom and dad was set aside for the work of the gospel and for the life of the local church so that was in me that you bring offerings you bring some financial transaction and make that available for the work that was in the, the going on in the life of the church you know, when we come to church today, I'm sure you are like me. All you check on is, have I got my phone and have I got my keys? When I grew up, you checked if you had your Bible and you if you had your offering. Those were the two things that you checked on. But how our lives have changed. But that was, that was the story in my home. Yeah, number one, Sebastian. Right? Okay. Well, I was actually just thinking when he said that, you know, um, in the 60s, you didn't just have your offering and your Bible. You had to have your Sunday clothes and your hat on. Okay, and now you seem to have to wear your ripped jeans and um, a drive-through coffee to come to church. They seem to be the most important things, you know. 
I just want to say a disclaimer before we even get started. You know, I remember watching the Robert Morris series, which is amazing on money. And I remember hearing one or two people saying, oh, he was bragging. And I just want to say a disclaimer at the beginning. This is almost uncomfortable for us to talk about money. And any examples we use, it's to encourage you and it's to use it as examples. We are not setting ourselves up as gurus on this or look at us or how wonderful we are by any ways. So I just wanted to say that at the beginning. So I grew up in a home where tithing was very much the thing. And my parents were missionaries and I, you know, I'd grown up abroad. And um, I can remember coming back, it must have been 1966, 67, and we were in Northern Ireland. And somebody came round and they gave me, they gave us a half a crown. Now, that's, I'm dating myself, you know, I had to even look up what a half a crown was. It's an eighth of a pound, I worked out, which is two shillings and sixpence. And so I got this half a crown, this, and I remember thinking, this is just amazing, you know. And then my dad said to me, now, you need to tie that. So he worked out, you know, it's 30 pence. If it was in today's money, it'd be 30 pence. So I put in a thruppenny bit. So I had a thruppenny bit of my money, and I took it to the offering. And my dad told me the lesson about, you know, now you give to God. You can never outgive God. He will give you back. And I was like, okay, Dad, you know. The next week, another missionary came, and they gave me a whole crown, which was five shillings. You see, I have learned all my life that you can never, ever outgive God. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter how little you give. He will always give it back to you and in abundance. So I knew what tithing was. Tithing has never been an issue to me. I just always knew. I can remember you know, getting my first job and working out how much I got and then how much I had to give away. And it just, I just knew 10% was just what we did. Um, I'm just looking here. Yeah, even when, you know, our pocket money was tied. I remember going to boarding school and we got pocket money. When I was 14 to 16, we got pocket money. And we were encouraged because it was a Christian boarding school, but I already understood tithing. And we would take that out and we would put it into the offering. And, you know, when I think back of that little boarding school and the offering bag to go around with all these little missionary kids, and we had just been taught how to tithe, and we just put it in. We never, ever thought why you wouldn't. We never, ever questioned it. So tithing was just always part of who I was. I never have found it difficult. Yes, so in our home then, together, we got married in 1982, before most of you were born. But we got married in 1982 as students. And in those days, you, you were able to get a grant. And so we had the 3,000 pounds as a grant in that first year, I always remember, <clears throat> that we had 3,000 pounds. But our rent was 100 pounds a month. That took it to 1,200 went. But we learned and we started and we began this whole principle of giving a tenth of our, that which we had away. So everything that came into us, the grant that we came in, we decided that together now, this was us now in our marital home, and we decided that's what we're going to do. We're going to give uh, 300 away as tithe throughout the year. It left 1,500 for us to live on throughout the year. It was just over 100 pounds a month. And we can only say that we were, God was faithful to us in that. We learned that whole business of when the Bible says, test me in this. It's the only invitation throughout the scripture that invites you and I to test God on anything. And so I guess if there's a first principle I wanted to say to you, that it'd be this one, that just as Elizabeth learned in her family and as then we began introducing in our family together, that God says to us, test, us, test him in this. And that's what we did. You know, what this 10 thing is all about, actually it is about systematic, intentional, planned, thought through uh, response to what we believed about God. That he, as we said this morning, is the owner of all things and is the provider of all things. So in that he invites you and I and encourages you and I to say, okay, what are we going to do? So that's where we started. We started small. Just where we had, just where we're at. We were students, we didn't have much, but we established the principle of tithing and re returning to God that which he'd invited and commanded us to return. You know, when you start something smaller, it makes it easier when there's more and larger comes into your home. Some people say to me, I, I couldn't afford to tithe. Our response was always, how can you afford not to tithe? But it's always easier when you start when you're small because who knows what God is going to give you and in those times when life goes on and more finance comes in, if you haven't established the pattern in your life, if you haven't established the principle in your life, when a lot comes into your world, then it's much more difficult to say, I'm going to give a tenth at this point. For Elizabeth and me, we began to, I guess, learn about the arithmetic of God is different from the arithmetic of us. 
In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 3, <clears throat> these are one of those scriptures that are important for us. It says, we, Paul wrote to them and said, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. In the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. You see, we learned at the, the early stage that actually it wasn't about the circumstances of our life that determined what our financial giving would be. It wasn't about the situation we found ourselves in that that was going to, to d decide how much we were going to give to God. That our giving was going to be determined by other things. That our giving was not going to be determined by the, the prevailing conditions. They had the prevailing conditions of, ex of a severe trial. They had difficult situation because they had extreme poverty. And yet their reaction was overwhelming and overflowing joy. That was a choice. And for you and for me, how do we give? Do we give out of duty or do we give out of joy as we come? We'd made a decision in our early lives that actually let us be joyful givers because we realized that everything we had was because God gave it to us. And so there was our starting point of intentionality of our giving. You know, this we're going to talk a little bit more about the next stage up of what offerings and gifts look like. You know, all of our, our, our lives, we've never had envelopes that have come through the door with money. We've never had uh, people stuffing wads of cash in our pockets. It's never, ever happened to us. They've never had a response <clears throat> like that. But we're always grateful that God created opportunities for work. He created extra opportunities for work that he might supply all our needs. And Elizabeth will share a little bit more about that. For, but to finish the story of our home before we're going to, this is the what that we did. <clears throat> to finish the what, you know, Psalm 37 verse 25 says, I was young and now I'm older, or for me it's older, it's not old, it's older, okay? <laughs> I was young and now I'm older, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Never. And that's been the principle in our life as we've just systematically and regularly and consistently started small and given back to God and to given of what he's given us. To always establish the intentional choices. So that's where we're at. So six reasons why we, we give. Number one, we give because it's a principle from the Bible. We give because it's a principle that's in the Bible. The Bible is full of stories of a God who gives. A God who's generous, a God who continues to, to pour out on you and me again and again and again. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave. It's inherent in his character to be a generous and a giving God. But it's also a principle that the Bible describes and encourages you and me to be givers. Not to be receivers, not to be holders on, but to be givers. Because in that we mirror the image of God and we look like what he is. Matthew 10, 5 to 8 says, Jesus sent the 12 uh, harvest hands out with the charge. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You've been treated generously, so live generously. You and I know it as freely you have received, freely give. If you look in your Bible, there's often an exclamation mark next to the freely you've received, freely give. It's not an invitation. It's actually a command. Come on, you've received freely, so have that attitude within your heart that says, I'm going to freely give. So we give because the Bible encourages and tells us to give. It's a principle that runs all the way through the Bible. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. I love that because the reality for all of us, if we follow the principle that the Bible says, you will never outgive God. That which you give will always return to you and then something more. Yet we're so fearful sometimes, so anxious to give and to release that which is in our hand, thinking if I give that, then some of the pie that I have is going to go. How wonderful it is that God always returns to us that which we give. This last one I want to share with you about the principle of why we give, because it's in throughout the Bible. Deuteronomy 15, 11. Please take these scriptures down, go home and have a look at them yourself. <clears throat> if you didn't get them, that's Matthew 10, 5 to 8, Luke 6, 38, Deuteronomy 15, 11. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites. You know that if you, as you're sitting here today, the natural position of your anatomical hand is partially flexed. For those medics among you, you'll know that. But your hand sits in a partially flexed position. That's the natural place that your hand sits. Your hand doesn't naturally sit open. It sits with partial flexion. But it takes a command from the brain to the hand to open your hand. It takes a command from the, the, this bit of your brain, your 
cerebral cortex on the left hand side that travels down and opens your right hand. That's the reality. It takes a command in all of our lives that opens up our hands. It doesn't happen naturally. Naturally, we tend to be those that are careful and considered about what we have. Naturally, we're those who tend to look after what we have in our hand. Naturally, we tend to hold on to what we have. But can I encourage you, it's principle number one, why we give, because the Bible says that you and I should give, that we should be those who have an open hand, have be unflex our hand. <clears throat> the Bible is, God is not really after your wallet, he's after your heart. And as we obey that principle, it gives us a soft heart and an open hand. So principle number one, we give because it's a principle that's, that's running through the life of the Bible. Okay, you've taken 10 minutes. I'm you're sorry. supposed to be five. <laughs> sorry, guys, you're in for a, a run It'll be tonight. right on time, no, too much won't. time. Right on time, too much time. <laughs> right. The second one, prioritizing our money. In Matthew 6, 19 to 21, it says, Don't keep hoarding for yourselves earthly treasure that can be stolen by thieves. Material wealth eventually rusts, decays, and loses its value. Instead, stockpile heavenly treasure for yourselves that cannot be stolen and will never rust, decay, or lose their value. And this is a great verse. For your heart will always pursue what you value, how you value your treasure. Your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. Now, you know, we all have passports. We all have, we all are um, passports, have passports for different countries. But you know, when we're a Christian, we become a citizen of heaven. And it spoke in that verse about, you know, stockpiling your heavenly treasure. In 1962, when my mom and dad were going out to the mission field, they sent, they packed trucks they packed big trunks, they were called, of clothes for the next five years and sent them on to a country we were about to live in for five years. Because in those days, that's what you did. So they prepared all the stuff and sent it on ahead. Do you know what? We are living here and we should be sending on ahead what we're going to be having in heaven, okay? So my mom and dad sent these trunks there and they arrived a few months late after we got there. And you know, every, every season there was the next set of clothes that my mom would take out for us to wear. All the underwear and socks and vests and things like that for the next five years. And she planned all of those. And then when the new baby came, well, he was just secondhand stuff. But you know, that's what she did. And you know, as citizens in this earth, you know, as citizens in he here, we are citizens of heaven. So she, we should be stockpiling treasure in heaven. Yes, we should be yes. sending it on you know, yes, yes. Um, whatever. So that was, that was something I'd wanted to mention. It's a predetermined decision we make. Yes. So we made a decision that we would tithe. That was never going to be an option for, for me. It was very easy. I remember having a few discussions. He said, oh, well, if that's what you think. And he knew it was right, but he hadn't experienced it the way, you know, that way. Sometimes we are very, very proactive about, you know, if we go shopping, we know what we want, how we want it. We want to you know, we want to do something. We are very sure of what we want to do. We need to be very proactive of our giving. We not just let it slip by, you know, oh, well, I'll tithe next month or I've almost given 10. We need to be active and make a choice of what we give and not be passive about the whole thing. You know, <clears throat> another thing we made a decision was we were going to continually review what we gave. Because, you know, your circumstances change. Sometimes Ian would take on some locum work, which meant that actually he was earning more. So when you say, oh my goodness, I forgot to tie that bit. We didn't become religious about it, but we would always round up, never rounded down, never gave to the 32 pence, let's put that in the offering. We always round it up. So when our, inc when our circumstances changed, we would always look. If there was an increase in, I think, I believe teachers are going to get a pay soon, hallelujah, I will review it again. You know, this is what we do. When I left work and I was at home, I began to give my family allowance. Hello, that needs to be tithed as well because that's income coming into the family. So I learned to tithe because my mom had taught me how to tithe my family allowance. So different things like that, you know, if there was overtime or that. And the thing I would say is it all means discipline. You have to discipline yourself to give. You can't become passive and think, you know, it'll happen. Que sera, sera. It doesn't happen, okay? Let money serve, let, let money serve us. Let's not us 
be served and governed by money, okay? And so that was the thing. And in, Ma in Psalm 112, verses 5 to 11, it says, Life is good for the one who is generous and charitable, conducting affairs with honesty and truth. Their circumstances will never shake them, and they will never forget their example. They will not live in fear or dread of what may come, for their hearts are firm, ever secure in their faith. Steady and strong, they will not be feared. They will not be afraid, but will face calamity. You know, they will not, and it says in verse 9, never be stingy and always generous to those in need. So that was one of the things, you know, about about how we live, that, those principles. This song, we, this morning we were singing this song, I will look back and see that you are faithful. And you know, we look back with tremendous gratitude at how faithful God has been. And we can look ahead knowing not just he's able, he is more than able, you know. Tithing was never difficult. Offerings were another thing. I can remember thinking, oh, tithes and offerings. Oh, I'm good at the tithing, but not the offering. So then we made a conscious decision um, Ian would do some locum work and we thought, right, the first locum of every month, we're just going to give it away. We're not tithing it, we're just going to give it away. And that was working great because he would work. I was producing all these babies at home and didn't work. So um, Ian had, you know, that's what he did and we got a, you know, a locum work and that was fine. Then one month, there was only one locum work and was like, oh, do we give it? Because we really needed it and we had made this decision. Our tithing was good. This was our offering. So I said to him, well, and he goes, well, we've made that decision. You know, and it says in Ecclesiastics there, when you make a vow to God, Ecclesiastics 5, verse 4 to 5, when you make a vow to God, do not delay or fu to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It's better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. So we said, right, that's fine. So we sowed that, that gift away, the whole gift. The next day, like Ian said, we never had envelopes with money stuffed in underneath our doors, but the phone rang. Ian, I've got a few locums lined up. Can you do them? You see, God always allowed us to use what was in our hand, and we were able to, to, to do that. So that was that one. Great. Okay. Another reason why we give is it positions us for a blessing. I don't know how many of you love when a blessing comes your way. When something nice happens to you, somebody says some good things to you, or thing, things happen in your life that are unexpected and they come your way. But how wonderful it is to know that if you and I get into the habit of opening our hands and taking what God has placed within them and, and making it available for others, that it actually positions us for a blessing. You know, the, the, I think as we look back in our lives, we see our lives as being incredibly blessed. You know, I've got one amazing wife. She's, I hope, got one amazing husband. Uh, we've been 37 years married this year, been 41 years together. We've got five wonderful children who have married five amazing spouses. They have produced seven kids. They're now in three different continents around the world. All are working and all are serving Jesus in the life of the local church. It's amazing blessing that has come to the Duthie family. And it's real, the reality is it's not because of what we've done, it's because of his grace and his kindness. But I guess would we look back and think, I wonder if the positioning for blessing that God promises is because of what we've done. The blessing that has come to our home is because of what we have done in terms of the faithfulness of our giving. We're not saying that one equals the other. And as Elizabeth said quite rightly at the beginning, that's not the, the tenor of what we want to say uh, this evening. But there's a truth that 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this, that whoever sows sparing will also reap sparingly. If you sow, I said it this morning, if you sow generously, you will reap generously. Proverbs 11, 25 says a general generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will always be refreshed. What a wonderful promise that is, to know that if you go around refreshing others and giving in, and being generous to others, something is always going to come back to you. It's, a, it's an eternal principle that God has designed, that as we give, we are always going to receive, that giving actually positions you for a blessing. Psalm 112, 5, Elizabeth just quoted it, it says, good comes to those who lend money generously, conduct their business affairs, and uh, don't chase after wealth. How amazing that is, that good actually will come to you. You don't have to go chasing good, you don't have to go chasing abundance, you don't have to go chasing blessing. Blessing will come to you if you open up your hand and give what God has placed within your hand. So it's always been a, a, a reason for us to give, is that we position ourselves for a blessing. Malachi 3.10, you know it, says, 
must bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing that you, until it overflows, I will rebuke the devour, devourer for you. What two great truths there. That actually what God is saying is test him in this whole business of giving. Test him in this whole issue of generosity. Test him in this openness of your hand. Because as you do, will he not open heaven's window? What is a window? A window is a conduit through which things travel. It's, we've got window light coming through here. We've got sunshine coming through here. A window is one of those things in our lives that brings one from one environment to another. And God says that if we give, then we know that there's going to be blessing. We'll be leaving his, as it were, his side of the, the bargain and traveling through into your life and my life. That's always been a wonderful promise and a wonderful encouragement for us to give. That giving actually positions us for God's blessing. Several years ago, we had an amazing privilege to be at a garden party that the Queen puts on at Holyrood. And the two of us were all dressed in our finery. We're all in the suits. and the, Well, I was in a suit and she was in, in something fine too. And we went down there for the cucumber sandwiches and the whole thing. But we started saying to the folks, where does the Queen come and where does her and Philip come out of the... Holyrood Palace and where do they go and the guy said oh they come down that stairs and round there so the two of us thought we would go early and we snuck up and stood right at the front of the queue Nobody was there as the two lines were there, but we positioned ourselves so that Queen Elizabeth would come round and we'd get an opportunity for the hello mom and she would give us a blessing of just passing by. We'd positioned ourselves for that. It didn't happen actually because they chose who they were going to speak to, but we were right at the front of the queue. Why? Because we took time to actually position ourselves for the place of blessing that was coming. And I believe that as we give to God, it actually opens up the opportunity. It opens up, it stops the devourer from coming and taking from that which you have if we have an open hand and make available for him and give. So that's another reason why we give. We give because it positions us for the blessing of God. Um, the message version of Deuteronomy 15 verse 10 says, give freely and spontaneously. Don't have a stingy heart. The way you handle matters like this triggers God, your God's blessings in everything you do, all your work and ventures. Now, tithing, I'd said, was absolutely no issue with us. You know, and in this season when he did local work, that's what we decided to do with offerings. But then seasons change, and, um, and we weren't doing so much, lo Ian wasn't doing so much local work, I went back to work. And we had heard about other people saying, you know, well, I don't just give 10%, now I give 11%. I thought, well, that's actually a good way of doing it. We could give 11%, so I never need to feel guilty when the preacher speaks about tithes and offerings. So I think, well, we're giving a little bit more anyway, so that's okay. So we did that gradually. So one year we started giving 11%, and then you don't notice it when it's gradual. The next year was 12%, and then a couple years later it was 13%. And I'm not going to say now what percent it's, it is, because that's between us and God. But, you know, we have just increased and increased to see what God has done. The other thing I think with tithing and offerings is, you know, that seed that we have that Ian was talking today. And so we, we have never looked at the seed that we sow into other ministries as part of our tithe. That's separate. We've always, we've, we've given our, our tithe, whatever percentage that is, and then we have this offerings bit. And in those offerings, the offerings we give, and I, I'm not saying this in all, I, as a disclaimer, I don't want to say it as a brag, but this is, what, this is how we would do it, you know. We give to the Bible Society. We've got three compassion children, our Toto child, Care for the Family, TBN, Hope for Justice, Barry Woodward's ministry, we believe in that, and a couple other things. So that would be our seed. So that actually isn't to do with the local church. We just have believed in these ministries, you know. And for the last, I think it was 30 years, you know, because we've got Rob Parsons coming later on this year. And I was, I was thinking, we have sowed into his ministry for 30 years. We never knew he would actually come to our church. We're excited, you know, that he's coming. He has no idea we're sowed into his ministry, but we have faithfully sowed into that. Just thinking, well, and I don't want to find out. I don't need them to say, hey, wonderful. We're just a number that money pops in. But you know what? Heaven, we're there for eternity, right? So heaven is going to be an amazing time. We're going to go around heaven going, oh, is that what my seed did? Is that what happened to that person? Because our seed goes out there. And I trust the places that we give our seed to, that they're going to do something with it. They don't, ha they don't have to tell us anything. So that's how we do it. We've got our tithe that we've worked out. 
and our, because we did a little bit more, it's our offerings, and then our seed is out with that. Um, then out with that would be the, we always have an annual offering for missionaries. That doesn't come out of our tithe, it doesn't come out of our seed, it just comes out as an offering. So that's something we've always decided, that's something that needs to be given. Growing up in the mission field, I have a real heart for that. So whether, so every year we've just always given a gift that's just a gift. Um, you know, and it says when we align our hearts, it triggers God's blessing. It says, Proverbs 21, 13, if you stop your ears to the cries of the poor, your cries will go unheard and unanswered. If we, let's think about it. If we stop, it says, if you, and it says in the Passion Version, if you close your heart to the cries of the poor, so if we close our hearts to the cries of the poor, then the Lord says, I will close my ears when you cry out to me. I don't want to be in that situation. I want to be able to cry to him and he hears me. So let's always remember, it says that you will always have the poor with you. As different personal illustrations, you know, and I'm saying this here again, just as some illustrations. When my dad came here in 1993, he had no salary. We were part of a different church. And so he started doing locum work to sustain him. And I knew it wasn't enough because, you know, so my sister and I got together and said, you know what, we're going to withdraw some of the tithes from our church and we're going to tithe and help dad out with his salary. And that's what we did. It was very humbling for my father to then have to get some tithe money from his two daughters to help him. But actually, he needed it, and they wouldn't have managed without it. We had no idea we were sowing into the future of what would be our journey. Quite amazing, isn't it? You sow into something, never knowing it's coming back. Many times, we always had a, a, you know, a heart to sow into other people in ministry, never thinking that we would actually be part of ministry someday. Two or three examples popped into my head. Um, a few years ago, there was, a, there was a lovely man called Dennis here that used to attend church. And um, I remember one day saying to him, you know, I just feel we should give Dennis money. We popped, I think it was 100 pounds in an envelope. And I just came and I said, Dad, just, just give it to Dennis. Don't let him know where it's from. And unknown, we never knew what happened. We would do that many times and never know what happened to it. But on a couple of occasions, you know, you do get the stories back. Heaven's going to be a great revealer for that. And I can remember he stood up before he left. You know, he was there and he did his course and everything. Before he left, he says, I need to give testimony. One day I was coming, it was winter, and I only had enough money for a bus fare to get to church. I didn't even have the return fare to church. But I prayed and said, Lord, if you get me to church, will you get me home again? He said, I wanted to be here. He said, and I came into this door. He says, and I had a great service. And as I was leaving the door, Pastor John just slipped me an envelope. And we never said it was us. But I remember hearing that testimony thinking, how amazing that we were responsive that day to do that. I can remember there was another pastor down in, in um, there was training down in Edinburgh, wasn't it? And we had this, uh, I don't know why we sent him 65 pounds. <laughs> it seems a really weird figure, but we, we wrote this check and said, I think well, we sent this off, we sent it to him. Unknown to us, this man years later told us oh, a few months ago, he phoned and he was in tears and he had been a young trainee pastor. And when the offering had been taken at the end of the day, it had gone into, this, into a, a cupboard or something. But when the pastor went to collect it, 65 pounds was missing. And he pulled this young trainee man aside and he said, you have stolen the money. And he was heartbroken because it wasn't his. And he didn't know how he was going to get it. And the next day, a letter came from us with a check for 65 pounds. I mean, stories like that, you know, I don't know any other stories. But I know there will be stories to find out in heaven of what happened. And so I just wanted to share, we can never, ever, ever outgive God. And that's why I just want to share those few things with you. Two to go. Is that okay? You still with us? Okay, we give because it's a principle from the Bible. We give because it prioritizes our money where it goes. We give because it positions for us, us for a blessing. We give because it puts our heart in align with God. Elizabeth and I have always given because it partners with a bigger vision and also the vision of this local church. That's one of the reasons why we give. We give because God's got a bigger plan than what we're part of, but also we give because of the plan that God has through this local church. You know, the Proverbs 11:24 says that the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. You know, as we look back over 40 years just serving Jesus, just, from the small town of Fraserburgh and seeing what, how God has enlarged our world, what amazing people we've met, amazing people that are in this church from all over the world, amazing experiences that God has allowed us to, to, to encounter all over the world. 
We look back and think, God, you've been so kind and so gracious. And it is true that our world has increased so much. And we don't say that A equals B again. But again, it's, the, it's in behind the, the, the reality of what happens when you give. That your world just increases and increases and increases. But I think the, the, the truth for us is, is that we can't go everywhere, but our finance can go some places that we can't go. The, the seeds that we sow here go all over the world. And that's always been our reality, We've, because I guess Elizabeth has come from a missionary background. It's always been such a powerful thing that we can't physically go, but the finance that God puts into your hand and my hand, as we open that up and make it available for him, that goes all over the world. And for me, I love the vision of this local church. I love what this local church is part of and, and is, is involved in. For us to be a church that equips and encourages men and women and boys and girls to reach up and become more like God, to reach out to the community that is around and to reach into the destiny that is theirs. You know what? I buy into that. I love that. I love the fact that that is changing lives and changing families, changing cities and who knows, maybe changing nations. I love that. I love that the whole world comes here, sits for a little while, gets its PhD and does whatever it's doing and then goes back somewhere, carrying a little bit of the life of this local church. How amazing that's going to be, just as Elizabeth says, what heaven is going to reveal of the warmth that you have expressed, of the kindness that you have, have experienced, of the, the goodness that you have been to others as they've come into this, the, this local church we're part of. You know, even if I wasn't the pastor, or I wasn't for a long time, we still believed in the vision of this local church. And that's the reason we give. We give to what God is doing in and through this local church. Give to what God is planning to do in and through this local church. So one of the big reasons for us to give is this is our home. This is where we get fed every week. I stand there for the first half hour and get fed by the worship, get fed by the welcome, get fed by the people that are around me, get encouraged by those voices that come around and lift us up, get encouraged by, by the experience of all of you and the privilege of us being together week in, week out. How amazing is that? Hey, how, I don't know if it lifts your spirit, but it lifts me every week. I come in sometimes a bit down and drained, and yet in your company, we get lifted as we gather together, and as we go together, and as we grow together. How wonderful it is for us to be at this season, at this time, together doing what God wants to do in and through us in the life of our city. So why wouldn't I give? You know, over my lifetime, I have got on here 79 pence goes from my phone in my account every week for room on the iCloud. Huh? You with me now? You understand? 79 pence. Sometimes 79, maybe even 99 pence goes from this phone or the account that backs this phone up to buy iTunes. Yes? Over my years, I've got an iPhone. I've got an iPad. And some of you won't remember this, but this thing's called an iPod. I know it's a relic, I know it's ancient, it still plays good tunes. <laughs> you know, the truth is that I, in a little way, have contributed to the journey of Apple moving from a garage operation to a worldwide amazing company. And I'm happy about that. But if I'm happy to give my finance on a regular basis every month to Apple for their iPhone, for their iCloud, for their iTunes, for their iWhatever, why would I not be happy to give into this local church that is transforming the world one life at a time, that is transforming the city and your life and my life week in, week out? Why would I not want to give into something that is making eternal significance? Now, these are great tunes, but the battery runs out every day. We're giving for eternal transformation. Why wouldn't I want to give? So Elizabeth and me have always given into the life of the local church. If I've been going to McDonald's, I don't pay Burger King for my meal. If I go to McDonald's and I get fed at McDonald's, why would I give Burger King my meal, my, my money? So for us, it's always been the home that we have had, the church home that is our church home, the place where we get fed and looked after, and people are kind to us and encourage us. That's where we've given to so that's reason number five. Last one, hon. So the last one is a spiritual legacy. You know, someday each of us have to stand in front of Jesus and he's going to say, so what did you do with the talent? What did you do with, with what I gave you? My children have to have their own story. I have to have my story. I can't stand on my parents' shoulders. 
and they have a great story too. Um, I can remember we taught our children to tithe with little pocket money and that. And I can remember my dad coming to me. He used to go out every two years to Afghanistan. And he came to me and he said, you know, Rachel's given me this little money box here. He says, and I've counted it. He says, and there's 50 pounds in there. Now, we did not give big pocket money, which I don't know, she probably stole from us. I'm not sure. No, I don't think she did. <laughs> <laughs> but she would, get, she would get coins and anything she found, and she would give it, and she would save it up over a year, and then she handed this little, little jar over to my dad and said, and said, don't tell anybody, grand, granddad, that's just for some missionary there. And, you know, she learned at a young age because we would talk about it at home. It says in Deuteronomy, talk to your children, talk at home, tell them these things, teach them, you know. And I was taught, I was taught well by my parents. And I just had wanted to close with a couple of stories that I had. Um, my dad passed away nine years ago. And um, there was, he passed away nine years ago. And I can remember just before he passed away, he had kind of, I think, you know, he was dying of cancer and he, he was praying that God would heal him, but I think inside he knew that maybe it wasn't going to happen. And he kind of looked at all of his bank accounts, and there wasn't a huge amount of money, but he made sure that my mom was going to be well looked after. And um, he looked at it all, and it was almost like, you know, well, I've sent luggage on ahead to heaven all my life. This is my last opportunity to send. And he looked at all, and he wrote this ridiculous check, which we didn't know about. And, you know, after he passed away... Um, this is the second story I wanted to leave with you. There was a phone call that came and this man from Northern Ireland phoned and he said, oh, it's John there. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to tell you. I said, but my dad isn't here anymore. He goes, oh, he says he did say he would be uh, so-and-so. I says, actually, my, my dad's passed away. And he goes, and the man was completely shocked. And over the years, he'd been quite a wealthy man and he would always send my dad two or three times a year a gift knowing that dad would always use it for the missionaries and he would send, sow it into the missionaries. And he had sent, and I'd forgotten about this story, but he had actually um, had, been, had a conversation with my dad two or three weeks earlier and was sending this. And my dad phoned him and said, now so-and-so, I can't remember his name. Now, don't send me this gift anymore because I'm actually not, I'm not going to be at this address anymore. I'm actually changing addresses because his address was now going to be heaven. But he didn't like to say he was dying because God might heal him. So he just said, you know, I'm going to be changing addresses and I'm not, no longer going to be in charge of this organization, but this is a direct way and you can actually put your money here. And he gave him all the details. And, you know, it was almost, he was thinking to himself, you know, I'm going to go, but this gift could still go on blessing people and I'm going to make sure it goes to the right place. He didn't have a big story about who he was and whatever. He just said, this is how to do it. I'm moving addresses. And I'd remembered about that story the other day. And, you know, about, I said the story, I started off by saying about my parents sent luggage on to where they were going to because they were going to be living there for five years. And, you know, we are sending luggage on ahead. You know, what treasure are we building up there? What, what, what um, amazing things are we sending on ahead? And, you know, like Ian said, we maybe won't be missionaries, we won't be going places, but we can send our finances. And you can never, never outgive God. And what Ian said this morning, I wrote down, because I really liked it, he said, get, your, get to know the relationship of the giver, not the gift. And you know what it says on these buses, try praying. I would say, try tithing, try giving. You will never, never outgive so, God. So. Yeah. Hey, that's just our story. It's a unique story. It's not a special story. It's just our story. But we thought it would be really good just to share our story and be vulnerable with you and let you know what our story is. But God is writing your story. He's putting what is in your hand, making available what is in your hand, and challenging you to say, what am I going to do with what is in my hand? You need to ask yourself today, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you about what is in your hand? You need to let the Holy Spirit ask you today, what am I going to do with what is in my hand? What are the things that are going to be my reasons for the, the time that you're standing here? Or you, you're going to be the one who says to your children, this is why we give. This is the, the conviction in our heart about why we give to what we give. There's nothing, there's nothing special about our story. Our story is just our story. It's not better than anybody else's. It's not worse than anybody else's. It's just what God has done in our lives. But I guess as we look back over 40 years of serving Jesus and looking at our lives together, 
We've been incredibly blessed. We've got an Ephesians 3.20 God who says that he is the one who gives exceeding abundant above what we ask or think or dream or imagine. Why wouldn't we respond to everything that he's given to you and me with an open hand that says, Lord, you have everything that you've given to me. Here it is, open for you. Come on, we'll stand this evening. We'll pray together. The band will come and then we'll, the young adults will go down for coffee. I think the rest, it's lovely if we open our hands. The rest of us will go a, home. Yeah, let's do that. Let's all open our hands. If you're comfortable, just open your hand. Just as that place of reception, that place of willingness, that place of surrender. Father, we thank you this evening, God, that you've placed so many wonderful things into our hand. You've put the very riches of heaven into our hands. You've put good things into our hands. You've put kindness into our hands. Lord, you've put financial resource into our hands. God, we thank you that you've made a way for us, Lord, to be a blessing to others. Lord, to open up, as it were, our lives to be the window through which you flow, you flow blessing from us to others, God. Father, we thank you that we can never outgive your generosity. You're a God who gives and gives and gives again. We thank you, Lord, as we sung earlier, that it's not about us. Your grace and your mercy just continues to give. While we were still far away from you in no interest, yet Jesus came and died on our behalf. Father, we are amazed by your generosity towards us. God, that that would move each one of us this evening to be men and women with open hands, men and women with open hearts, Lord. Lord, to look to see where the needs are that you want us to, to provide the answers. Father, to see what your Holy Spirit would say to us, to, to be start, as it were, giving and giving our lives away, giving our resources away. Lord, we might be your hands and your feet in the world in which we live. Father, we thank you so much for such an amazing group of men and women. We thank you how you've blessed us. You've been kind to us. You've been generous to us. God, we pray that as we walk forward into the rest of our lives, that generosity would mark us individually, mark our homes, mark this church. In Jesus' name, amen.